on the orange couch is Mayel Hassan, doctoral student at the University of Southern California. She's filling in as digital producer this week. She's here looking out for all your live feedback. Uh, make sure to tweet her your comments and questions with the hashtag AJStream. And joining her on the couch are TMS Teddy Rouge, co-founder of Project Diaspora, and Joel Charney, the vice president for humanitarian policy at Interaction. Welcome to the stream, gentlemen. Looking forward to all of your thoughts. Sure. Now, remember, you can join us in a number of different ways, including through Google+. Just add the stream to your circles like these people did, and you could wind up in the stream. Hi, I'm Ahmed. I claim to be from a lot of places, so let's cut to the chase. I believe in people power, and that's why I am still and will always be in the stream. Poor, hungry, and in need of assistance. That's the image some conjure up when thinking of Africa. It is this very depiction that has funneled more than $1 trillion of development-related aid to the continent in the last 60 years. Now, much of this financial support comes in the form of charities that provide materials such as clothing, food, and medical supplies. One such campaign is Tom's, which for every pair of shoes bought, donates one to a child in need. Here's a clip from their successful One Day Without Shoes campaign. I am going a day without shoes. To raise awareness for the millions of kids around the world who don't have shoes. One day without so shoes. Many are criticizing Tom's for typifying bad aid. This refers to any form of charity or don donation that might actually be harmful to the recipients. These organizations are accused of not only undercutting local businesses that provide the same goods, but also of dehumanizing the poor in Africa. It is this image that movements like A Day Without Dignity are trying to change. Have a look. Proponents claim aid has helped Africa, but critics view the current structure as a detriment. So what type of system can be deemed successful by both? Let's try to find out. Teddy, let's start with you. I mean, we're not only looking at Tom's. Uh, Tom's is just a you know, convenient example to look at from the very top. We can also talk about these, you know, buy a laptop and a kid in Africa gets a, a, a laptop. Slavoj Žižek also speaks about, for example, when you go to Starbucks, you pay $4 for your, for your drink and it tells you that you're helping a farmer in Africa. You're sort of buying into a system and that kind of eases your conscience. Um, is that one of the major reasons you feel a day without dignity is so necessary and why you need to sort of scramble that stereotype from the beginning? I think so. I, I, I like to call those types of marketing uh, ploys as kind of uh, sympathy marketing. Um, when it really should be about a market opportunity, and you say, you know, we have this great product that we bought from Africa, it's fantastic, you should just buy it, um, and we continue to buy that. Why can't we just limit it to just, you know, it's a great product, buy it if we have it. Um, and I think the dehumanizing comes into the fact that we have to continually be looked at as recipients, as the poor, as the only thing we have to offer are these piddly beans so that you can buy them in, you know, in your coffee or whatever the product may be from Africa. Um, it's the very same reason I have with some initiatives um, you know, for fair trade. A lot of it is geared towards, um, it is uh, you know, 
sympathy. You know, mm -hmm. let's pull your heartstrings, thereby pulling uh, your purse strings. I mean, it, it, it's um, it's not something that makes it sustainable for us to live, yeah. or, or as well giving us an opportunity to prove ourselves that, hey, we can create some fantastic products that you may actually want. We don't want you to buy it simply because, it, you know, we, because you're, you have sympathy for us, mm. but because we've created great products. Joel, good intentions, bad implementation, or, or something deeper? Well, I mean, I like, the, I like the idea that we need to get away from this, this charity overlay. Um, I have to say, though, that we need to build on the fellow feeling and solidarity that people have. I mean, those kids in the Tom Shoe video, I mean, truthfully, they mean well. They are trying to reach out. This is a way that's offered to them, and they, and they do it. So I think what we need to do collectively is an education effort around, well, let's take this feeling of solidarity that you have and turn it into something that's more effective, more meaningful. I mean, I wouldn't want to get into a situation where we're just kind of discouraging this feeling or saying, well, don't care. Um, I think we want to build on that caring, but in a way that actually works for, you know, poor people in Africa and Asia or, or wherever they may be found. Yeah. May's going to bring the community uh, in. May, lots to say from the community. Yes. Um, we have Karen in Google Plus right now with a video question. So go ahead, Karen. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you guys for having me on the show. Um, I have a question. Um, now, sort of the hot. Uh, the hot topic is that Africa's economies are now growing at rates at four, five, six percent. <clears throat> and so, how much can we really credit aid and charity and, like uh, Teddy said, um, sympathy marketing to this? I mean, it's more about trade and investment and private capital markets, isn't mm -hmm. it? Not so much about charity. Okay. Okay. Good. Good question, uh, Karen. And I want to sort of uh, supplement that with this map uh, which uh, we obtained uh, from uh, Chris Kuhn's uh, website actually, about the fastest growing uh, economies in the world. Six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. And you look at you know, Ethiopia 8.4%, Rwanda 7.6%, Angola 11.1%, etc. And it shows that you know, the Chinese are, are doing big business. The United States dwarfed uh, in, in, in comparison with regards both aid and trade to Africa. With that uh, in mind, Teddy, uh, is, is Karen right? Is it all about trade? Is all this growth attributable to trade? I would have to say it would have to be attributable to growth. I mean, you, you know, 50 years uh, worth of aid and over a trillion dollars into the system, and we only have six countries that are, you know, growing as, you know, ranking, a, a, um, you know, a, a, at the top level in, in uh, global growth. Um, I think a lot of it has to come from the trade that we do, from the investments that we do, from diaspora businesses that are being started, um, as well as the investments that we actually make with those, with those businesses and are able to push our products internationally and build on those economies. Mm -hmm. I don't see any country that has ever grown uh, because of aid, as but, it were. But, but, but Joel, the Chinese, for example, are huge in Africa in a business sense hardly the most popular with the way they're doing it. So if people are saying trade, not aid, the way the Chinese are doing trade, immensely unpopular in many African countries. People see this as neo-colonialism, also stealing well, the market it's, share. It's from incredibly them. reminiscent of the colonial system as it was implemented, where, I mean, the Chinese are an extreme example, going in, bringing Chinese workers, not hiring locally, extracting basic products, and you know, maybe selling some military goods to the repressive governments on the, on the side. I mean, the thing about growth from aid and the, and the growth statistics that you're, you're citing, macro growth is one thing and equitable growth is another. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you have to have growth to begin to, you know, to, to divide the, what accrues from that, um, from that trade. But if you're not, if you don't have an equitable way of distributing that through a tax system or through government projects that are targeted to the poor, 
sure, you can have 11% growth in Angola, but who's benefiting from mm. that growth? I mean, yeah. we can't lose sight of that. Excellent point, Karen. I hope you feel it was comprehensively addressed. May let's dip into some more feedback. Yeah, we have Laura in Google Plus with a question. Please go ahead. Thanks so much. So my question is, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on investment in Africa, a lot of emphasis on, you know, understanding that people need jobs, they need to be able to um, make money and, and sustainably support their own communities. How do we get people and, and particularly large investors to invest in real projects in Africa? And I'm not talking about sort of handicraft marketing. Sure. You know, I don't need another basket made by a refugee woman. Um, I only need so many pairs of shoes mm -hmm. made by victims of sexual violence. Um, so, and how do we get beyond that into things that are really the building blocks of a modern economy? Fantastic question. Who wants to tackle that? Uh, perhaps Teddy? What's a real project? <laughs> um, a real project to me looks like uh, early Bertie's shoes. They have um, a factory in Ethiopia, actually, mm. and they're producing real high-end shoes that they're, you know, exporting out there. They've decided that, you know, they want to create jobs in Ethiopia. They've gone there, they've set up a factory, and they're, you know, they're training people. As they grow, they employ more people. If you look at the continent as a resource, human resource for yourself, and you say, you know what, I'm going to do the long haul here and look at this continent and say, there's an opportunity for me to actually run a business, a global business, and have my workforce either in Africa, or have my intellectual capacity in Africa, and, and actually get that done. But that takes somebody who, ha who can look at the continent from a different perspective and say, there's an opportunity here. It's not just simply a sympathy case. But at the same time, you also have to avoid things like what Bono did. He went and you know installed a market uh, um, and invested there, but then he quickly pulled out because his investors wanted a quick return. You have to look at the long haul when you're looking at Africa because you have to create the entire value chain for whatever product mm -hmm. you're trying to create, and that takes time. Yeah, but I'm reminded uh, about um, Ethiopia. Joel, I wonder if you want to tackle this. Uh, you know, it seems as if all African leaders are equal, but some are more equal than others when it comes to being recipients of aid. And politics, global geopolitics, has a lot to do with this. So, for example, a country like Ethiopia, where Melisanawi gets roughly $3 billion a year from the United States, from sure. Britain, and elsewhere. There's some credible, very strong reports from human rights agencies saying that he you know, actively starves the Ogaden region because there's an insurgency there. But Zanawi's, you know, kind of, he plays ball. He's, he's on board. So there isn't really much political capital and not many people are really interested in labeling him bad names and calling for uh, campaigns uh, against him. Uh, does that not open up an entirely new, you know, sort of can of worms when it comes to aid politics on the continent? Well, see, what, what do you want to tolerate? What mm. are you going to tolerate? I mean, this is the classic, do you want stability with a, some human rights violations that are, that are serious? Stability, though, that will allow the kind of international investment that, that might make a difference? I mean, we decided in the, in the 90s, we, meaning the United States government, that whole block of, of states, you know, we like Kagame, you know, we like Museveni, you know, these are, you know, the people that the U.S. government feels like they can work with, and they really do overlook, in, in some cases, some pretty serious human rights violations. And again, this is, the, the challenge is to find, the, what is the right model? I mean, you want democracy, you want justice, you want rule of law, but you also want economic growth in one nice package. Which and the world is rarely that neat. So, you know, I, I just think it's, I mean, from a non-governmental organization perspective, therefore, where we come out is work with the government and try to make the governments better. But in the meantime, let's give real assistance at community level that is controlled, managed by the communities. Now, I agree we're not going to get out of poverty through a ton of micro projects, but these little initiatives that the communities control can, can make a difference. And I, I think fundamentally, mm -hmm. if you talk about a model, you're looking at a balance between big things that have to be done at a government level and direct assistance that people own and manage themselves in, in local communities. Eloquently put, May? Well, before we go to our next Google Plus question, to 
augment what you said, Joel. Um, Paul believes that there needs to be equal opportunities for Africans by removing trade barriers. Right. So what is the issue with the trade barriers? The issue is that the United States and the European Union is, if anything, worse. They want to protect their own farmers, their own economy, their own producers, and you know they, they talk free trade rhetoric when it benefits, say, the United States, but when free trade might actually benefit, say, cotton farmers in the Sahel, all of a sudden it's not, we're not talking about free trade anymore. And, and I think also we also, you know, we, are, we have to look at the continent also as a market. 300 million who are joining, who are, uh, joining middle class uh, status on the continent, that's a market op opportunity for anyone who has trade. So we have to look at regionalization, infrastructure, opening up the border so that I don't need um, a passport or a visa to go to Ghana, to Ghana or Nigeria or South Africa, which I find completely ridiculous. Um, so if we can remove those barriers within the continent, we don't necessarily have to um, constantly be looking to the EU, constantly looking to America, can we get our products into your right. community? So Let's right. build those local I mean, you're markets. calling for the African Union to do something uh, similar to what the European Union is has been doing. Yeah. We actually did get a tweet in about this. I don't have it on the screen, but they were wondering how you could improve Africa to Africa trade within countries within Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, let's, I mean, the, if there's ever peace in the Congo, the Congo yeah. can be the economic driver of all of Central Africa. It, you it's, know, just, I mean, it is to Africa what Germany is to Europe. That's right. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we're, that we're still seem so far away from that, but I mean, the countries around Congo would just benefit tremendously from those kind of open borders and, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, uh, trade back and, back and forth. Okay, well, let's get um, Jill, who's in Google Plus. She has a question, so go ahead, Jill. Yes, hello. Um, I wanted to address uh, the, the, the comment that Joel made about um, handing, uh, ha handing out aid at the community level and having it be controlled and managed mm -hmm. by communities. How would you suggest, I, I spent close to two years in post-earthquake Haiti, where um, we saw examples of people not really living in camps, collecting aid. How do we effectively address getting aid to those who need it most and most effectively and balancing you know, those, those competing interests of, of people managing to get into the system and and use it to their advantage in selling supplies on the black market, et cetera. Yeah, so superb uh, question there, Jill. And, and I'm reminded of uh, the Lancet as well coming out with this uh, report, scathing indictment of the aid agencies in Haiti post-earthquake, saying that they were using corporate business tactics for survival, jostling in, in some sort of uh, power play against each other for attention, um, for more aid money. You had a piece in The Nation uh, come out saying that, for example, the Clinton Foundation was building these schools after the earthquake, and most of those schools, when visited uh, a couple of years later, showed to have uh, carcinogens and no running water and that kind of thing. Um, Haiti, in a way, is very similar to many of these sub-Saharan African uh, countries when it, when it comes to aid. Uh, do you want to you wanna have a crack at what Jill had uh, asked? <laughs> well, one thing that I think all of us uh, in the development field, we need to look at uh, creating local capacity and ownership of those projects. Yes, also from a small project perspective, as well as from a large project perspective. Um, and education plays a huge role in that, in terms of uh, if you're going to turn over a project to uh, someone on the local level, are they educated enough? Do they have the intellectual capacity to carry on that project? So transference is really, you know, knowledge transference is, is important to the survival of those projects. But on the other side, I would have to say that a lot of aid organizations are really in the business of sustaining that very aid organization. So I tend to look at it from a perspective that they lose sight of why they are an aid organization, or why they want to um, continue being there. I think to me aid organizations should set a mandate on accomplishing a task or handing it over to the local capacity to actually complete the task and then cease to exist. Joel, is there a rat race and power plays going on between these aid agencies in a very survival of the fittest way? Unfortunately, yes. I mean, there's, they, I'm old school. I don't like the marketing and the branding talk. 
I don't like the competition to be the biggest organization. We need to be more humble. I mean, I, the best model for me from an NGO perspective is, is more or less to function as a foundation. And as an aid agency staff person, one goes into a place, one tries to figure out the strongest, the needs, but also the strongest organizations to meet those needs and then provide funding to those organizations. And if you do it that way with a little bit of humility, it's less about the branding and more about what those organizations are able to accomplish. Now, I think what happens in a place like Haiti is just the eyes of the world are on the place. I mean, Haiti was almost obscene mm -hmm. in, in terms of just the sheer overkill of the, of the aid operation, and it wasn't all the mainstream organizations that were, that were engaged in that rush. I mean, Haiti's proximity to the United States meant that hundreds of people who had never worked on an aid program in their entire lives were able to fly to Port-au-Prince and figure out- Do you, do you feel there was a sort of out, fetishism attached to it? Absolutely. Tourism? Yeah, it, it, not so much tourism, but just, it was um, just, it was so shocking mm what happened, and again, people genuinely wanted to help. They had no idea, unfortunately, how to help, but that didn't stop them. Hmm. May, I think we have time for just one more, either tweet or, or video comment. Okay, Which so was? we'll get a video comment from Huda, mm -hmm. who's in Google Plus. Go ahead. Hey, uh, so my question to you is, are there any aid initiatives aimed at reducing the very difficult and costly labor regulations and uh, the way in which businesses are operated. There are many indexes that show that the African region, it's very difficult to start businesses. And, mm. and I know this from my own personal experience in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, it's very, it takes a very long time, maybe half a year. Um, whereas in places like Singapore, it may take four days. Um, and it, basically research has shown that the less difficult these labor regulations are or product market regulations, um, the easier it is for competition to flourish, for people to get, to move from the informal to the formal sector, which creates job security. And I was wondering, are there any aid initiatives aimed at trying to reduce these labor regulations? And whether you think that is a job for aid, if technical assistance is a responsibility, um, and, you know, or is that paternalistic? Okay. Is, okay. That, is that actually preventing business investment? Are these labor regu regulations? I don't think so because uh, I mean, as, as, as she was talking, I think there's a lot of opportunity locked up in the informal sector that does need to move to the formal sector. Uh, I mean, the informal sector functions just fine without labor regulations. Uh, what I think is missing is the investment and the policies by the governments to actually move those um, individuals, all of that workforce capacity, into the formal sector. Joel, do you agree with that? I, I think. I, I would argue that there are definitely regulatory problems in, in Africa that could be solved. Whether that's a job for the aid industry, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But technical assistance to improve government performance. But again, we've been trying. So I mean, we're still struggling with exactly what the right recipe is. Yeah, and there's a big difference between, say, working with a Rwandan government and working with, I don't know, Equatorial Guinea. I mean, it varies from country <laughs> to country. To say the yeah. least. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, I mean, aren't we also, you know, uh, in danger of just creating a sort of monolith and saying this is the way Africa should be dealt with in terms of aid, aid or trade, Teddy? It's, it's very, it's very uh, localized, mm. and I think you're right. I mean, you look at Kagame and everybody says, yeah, economic, you know, fant operating uh, fantastically on, from an economic standpoint. Everybody says, but yeah, but from, you know, mm. all the other issues that, you know, you kind of have to overlook. But uh, I think we have to tailor uh, solutions at the local level really okay. and regionally because we can't put a panacea on the whole continent. Fair point. Hold that thought, although you made that <laughs> point but you can flesh it out in the post show. We'll continue the discussion in the post show. Thanks to everybody in the Google Plus Hangout, Joel, Teddy and May join us on stream.aljazeera.com. On Tuesday we look at free speech online. Should hate speech be protected? Join us then for that, and for now, join us in the post show. See you online.
Welcome back to the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. Joel was just telling me off air. Yeah, I you have, have a question. I yeah. have a I have a question, yeah. which <laughs> is what what is really going to be transformational? I mean, the classic anecdote is in 1962, South Korea and Ghana had the same per capita income. So look mm -hmm. at where we are now, 50 years later. You know, and what is going to trend, what, is, what kind of approach, see, because from an NGO perspective, the stuff that we do, let's face it, is pretty micro. And we need to do it better, and it can be transformational at a very small level. But assuming we want to get to a place where South Korea is, one of the 10 largest economies in the world, what do we need to do mm. in Africa, in what kinds of places, to really have that kind of transformational impact? Joel, um, before we move on, I just, want, I just got a tweet from Karen. She wants to know, related to your question, what about the role of diaspora and remittance in Africa's development? And I think, Teddy, you would be the perfect person to answer that question. I, I think we have a huge role. And, I, and uh, let me not say um, just simply diaspora. I think it's that combination of uh, diaspora, the continent's youth, as well as uh, the role of technology in, the de in developing the continent. I think we have an opportunity there that really hasn't been explored uh, just yet. I mean, you look at you know mobile penetration, which you guys talked about in a previous show. Um, we look at $40 billion in remittances from members of the diaspora. And I think for us as, as members of the diaspora, we need to organize as a transformational force. If we're going to own the continent, if we're going to take it away from, it wrestle it away from uh, being identified as the mecca for NGOs, we need to look at it as an opportunity for us. And we need to reclaim that. That $40 billion can really be transformational if we put it in the right areas. While um, you know, international aid organizations you really have restricted ways in which they can distribute their cash, we don't. We can really put it, that into our civil society directly and not necessarily have to involve any government agencies so or in, is, involve some government Is agencies. that the South Korea solution then? I think so. I think that's the China solution. That's the South Korea solution. Um, that's the India solution. But, you know, really powered by diaspora investment into those communities. Okay, I want to roll it back almost to the beginning and talk about perceptions again and the issues of sort of paternalism again. Teddy, I know you've seen this video. Joel, I know you've not. So I'm going to ask you what you think of it. I'm going to play you, say, the top 30 seconds and the bottom 25 seconds or so. This is Alex in Tanzania I love talking, <laughs> talking about Arnie and Commando. Have a watch. You see me? She's Nidia. She's Nidia. You in California. Them. She's the governor of California. One day, a not when his child, he, a child was called Jenny. The thieves come to attack that, they take the child of an old shoes nigga. But an old said, no, I must take my child. <laughs> okay, so now you've got like extensive commentary of Commando and Schwarzenegger, very animated from, from Alex. Let me take it towards the end, because this is where Mama Hope have uh, their message. Let's check this out. He killed by the pony. He took his child. Thank you. Stop the Pity, Unlock the Potential. That's MamaHope.org's campaign. And I wonder, Joel, A, what you think of it, and how would you compare and contrast perhaps to something that was really in the news recently, the Coney campaign from Invisible Children and the way <laughs> they had approached what they were trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, it, that what you just showed is really powerful, and it's the, it's the right message. Look, uh, true confessions, I was a Peace Corps English teacher in the Central African Republic, and every single adjective that was used to describe Alex could be used to describe all the kids I taught. So I mean, we're, we've missed out somehow in, in conveying that message. And yes, it is about dignity, and it is about what people can do for themselves, and it is about their, their potential, 
and know it's not about the great white hope or hope sweeping in. Um, but there's a genuine desire for connection and solidarity. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, I still think, so my, so my question is, how do you build on that in a constructive yeah. way? Uh, Teddy, Teju Cole had written about the Coney campaign. He called it the white savior industrial complex. Was <laughs> he being a bit unfair? No, he was not being unfair. He was absolutely right. Um, and it is, you know, and it's funny, and I wrote a few pieces about the whole Coney episode, and I, one particular um, comment really stood out, um, you know, among, you know, 400 different comments that I, that I received. Um, one person just tweeted or sent a message and was like, fine. You're on your own. See if I care. I mean, that's you ungrateful that, African. Yeah, exactly. It was me. <laughs> you ungrateful African. How dare you? I mean, how dare you? Fine, you're on your own. And 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 I was like, wow. This is. I mean, when we begin to speak out against things like this, I mean, you get comments like that, and it and it speaks to the fact is that for a long time it has become that Africa is everybody, everybody's unchecked right to go in and do whatever you want uh, to make yourself feel better or for whatever reason there is. You know, for large organizations, there is interaction perhaps to kind of, you know, organize everybody else. But for individuals and small organizations, uh, you know, like uh, Invisible Children and, um, and, uh, and, and um, the shoe, Hope, yeah. uh, the shoe company. Oh, the, oh sorry. Yeah, Tom's. yeah. For Tom's shoes, there isn't an organization to really say, you know what, you there, you know, we need to have an ethic, ethics conversation on how you're going to engage with the continent and how you're going to help. Yeah, and those questions really need to be asked by those individuals. I mean, interaction does have what we call the private voluntary organization PVO standards, mm -hmm. and I mean we have basic standards around the images that you can use about the way our member organizations are supposed to work. I would say, I can't say that they're 100% adhered to, but I mean, we do have a, a basic set of standards that our, our member organizations are, are supposed to live up to. But it, it's more than that. I mean, I had to fight my own organization previously because every time they wanted to do a cover of a brochure, yeah. they wanted to put an African on the cover. And we were a refugees organization. I wanted to say, hello, there are refugees in Asia, there are refugees in the Middle East, there are internally displaced people in, in South America. Why does the iconic shot always have to be an African woman with her, her baby on, on her back? I mean, we, it, it, it really is unbelievably um, persistent, mm. this right. image mm. of global poverty being in Africa. Right, yeah. right, Joe. I mean, there, the visuals and the rhetoric that's used to describe Africans as being poor. Michael Kirkpatrick just sent us this cartoon image talking about that Africa is rich in natural resources and we completely forget about that and human resources and says, so who is feeding who? Has this cartoon <laughs> um, lo looking at who's benefiting. Um, if, uh, what I would like to do is to actually broaden this discussion even more if it's possible and go to a video comment. Oh, apologize about that. Here we go. We have this video comment from Tyler. Hi, my name is Tyler. I'm in Ottawa, Canada. I'd say foreign aid is uh, definitely um, hurting Africa in the long run. Um, it always seems to be tied to uh, deeper integration with the global capitalist system emphasizing cash crops for export at the expense of food security, uh, raw material extraction at the expense of industrialization. So it's not really good. So what do you think about Tyler's question? Teddy, is this oh, about, I'll yo, you're going to give that, that over to Joel. <laughs> Joel, what first. about these accusations of this is neoliberal economics at its most inhumane? Uh, a big part of it is, but the governments, meaning the African governments, collaborate in that. Mm -hmm. And again, what's the alternative realistically? I mean, autarky was tried in extreme ways. I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, in, in Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge, they completely opted out of the international system. There have been various other experiments of completely opting out. I think what we need is kind of a just or fair, if there is such a thing, engagement with the international system. Yeah. I mean, it just, I find it, I can't keep the contradiction in my head to say 
we want trade, but we can't be a part of the international capitalist yeah. system. I mean, well, I, I don't, it seems where's as if nobody that going? has the answer as to what that model actually is, but many people resent the fact that the neoliberal model is imposed upon them as the only sure. uh, mm -hmm. model. And I suppose that's probably what you know, the, the question was, was getting at, uh, Africans and, and, and non-Africans uh, alike. Uh, gentlemen and ladies in the Google mm -hmm. Hangout, that's about it. That's a wrap, unfortunately. Uh, so much to say, so no, little thanks. Thanks time. Thank you very much, Joel, Teddy, and in our Google Plus Hangout community, uh, Huda, Jill, Karen, and Laura. Uh, great pleasure having all of you uh, on the show with us. Hope you join us again for another discussion uh, in the future. Now, we like to you know, mix things up here a little bit and sample the zeitgeist as to some of the stories out there and your appetite for them. So uh, May's here with uh, just a few story leads that we've been following. In France, Sunday marks the first round of presidential elections since the Toulouse shootings re brought renewed focus on immigration. Socialist opposition candidate Francois Hollande is campaigning under the slogan, The Time for Change is Now. Take a look. This video has gone viral and is widening the debate on immigration, with many seeing Olan as more supportive of immigrant communities. Incumbent President Nicolas Sarkozy is taking a tougher stance, vowing to reduce the number of foreigners permitted entry by half. He's also said there are too many immigrants in France. Next, South Africa, where American graffiti artist Above is creating controversy with the mural he painted outside of Johannesburg's largest diamond exporter. Here we have the video. The traders agreed to let him paint the wall because he said he would use the phrase, diamonds are a woman's best friend. He did not mention that he would also add, and a man's worst enemy, alluding to the violence fueled by the diamond trade. Vote these stories up or down by going to stream.aljazeera.com forward slash leads, and you may see your favorite on an upcoming episode. Back to you, Amon. Thanks for that, May. Don't forget, join us tomorrow. We talk about hate speech, abuse. Is there such a thing as hate speech or abuse on Twitter, Facebook, etc., under the umbrella of freedom of speech, or should there be certain restrictions? Join us with your comments and questions on that. Go to Facebook, like the stream, add us to your circles on Google+, or tweet using the hashtag AJStream. See you tomorrow. Bye.